All right, so thank you for having me. Really excited to talk about this. Uh, some of it you probably heard already this morning or before, or uh, it's going to be known to you. The other part is what uh, new changes are coming to the code for uh, Chapter 11. Uh, so let's get going. So first, you know, most of you know this. It's just uh, recapping, essentially, uh, what we're talking about in terms of uh, refriger refrigerants. I just adjust my screens a little so things are not in the way. Origin of history, so 1748, somebody figured out that by evaporative cooling, it could get a lot of cooling or heating, so uh, phase changes, right? Back, right back to thermodynamics. So first it was used in the meatpacking industry, obviously, obvious use, and then uh, Freon, developed by DuPont in the 20s, and... Uh, So uh, the vapor compression cycle, again, I, I meet a lot of engineers who uh, specify these systems, but really don't understand how they work on the thermodynamic level. So let's go through. First, you compress uh, gases. Uh, the compression cycle basically stays in gas until you condense it. That's why it's called a condenser. And then you have an expansion device that basically it's a high pressure and it, it evaporates into the evaporator and gives you that cooling. Pretty much just like any uh, spray bottle that you've used or, you know, uh, you notice the cooling on that. That's exactly how it works. And then the cycle repeats. Whether it's air cooled or, or water cooled, pretty much a similar, um, similar thing. So uh, at some point in the 80s, uh, we realized, you know, uh, getting all that air conditioning was great. However, you know, uh, both uh, for commercial, industrial processes, uh, you know, they were, they were uh, drilling a big hole in the ozone layer. You, some of you may remember that. Some of you maybe weren't born. I don't know. But, uh, you know, so that was the big, the big thing, the ozone hole. We, we weren't yet aware of uh, global warming potential. You know, it was just starting to talk about it but not not yet there and then um obviously there are some refrigerants that pose hazards right i mean we we don't we don't tend to look at them that way but uh, depending on the type and the class of refrigerant some of them are flammable some of them are toxic some of them displace oxygen uh, so they are dangerous you got to be careful on how you deal with them Let's go back to refrigerant families, right? In the past, we had R12, R22, R11, 123. Uh, you know, some of you probably are replacing still some of these machines. We still see a lot of R22 in New York City. Not so much R12 and R11, unless you have a very old car, you see R12. R11, I think the last retrofit I did R11 was probably 12 years ago. Uh, but anyway, they were phased out in 1987, but phasing out doesn't mean that you, you can't buy it anymore. They're, they're, it's not manufactured anymore, but there's plenty of, of uh, stock available. And then, you know, 20s, 2024, I think the, the Biden administration is trying to speed up the phase out of uh, 410A, which is what mostly we use today in VRFs. Um, so the problem with those is they, they don't deplete the ozone layer. Right, the past, the, the CFCs, HCFCs uh, depleted the ozone layer, right? The, the, the ozone depleting potential of R22 is 0.05, right? The ozone depleting potential of, of uh, 410A, which is what we use most, is zero. Unfortunately, the global warming potential of it is 2000, 2088, meaning that it is 2000 times more powerful than CO2. So one pound of, of, of 410A going into the atmosphere has the effect of 2,088 pounds of CO2 being discharged. That, that's really what it means. So it's enormous. And, um, you know, for those of you, I mean, most of you, I presume, are specifiers or, or designers. Uh, but, uh, you know, and the systems are brazed and whatever. And we don't, we don't, we don't factor in leaks, but they do leak. Uh, in Europe, for instance, um, when you buy refrigerant, uh, there are two ways to buy the refrigerant. You buy it for new systems. Uh, and then if you want to buy to refill, 
it's a different classification, and that's how they tally basically what their leakage rate is. In the U.S., there's no way to tally that up. You'll never get a strain hazard from anyone. Uh, so the new generations, H H HFCs, they're, they're blends. And of course, I'm sure you've, you've started to uh, specify R7744, which is uh, CO2. Uh, we talk about CO2 being a bad thing, obviously for global warming, but, but in this case, one pound of CO2 into the atmosphere is one pound of CO2 into the atmosphere, as opposed to 2000 for 410A. The other advantage of CO2, even though it works at much higher pressures, is that you need much less of it per ton than you would for the other refrigerants, right? I mean, generally for 10A, you need for a, for a split with short pipes, four or five pounds per ton. Uh, you know, uh, CO2, you need one, 1 1.2 pounds per ton. That's the rough rule of thumb, right? So, and it's very low global warming potential, which is really what we're concerned about. So we, we moved in phases, right? First it was, well, gee, we got this ozone layer hole, let's ban that. And, and, and find a new class of refrigerants. Finding a new class of refrigerants, we weren't worried by global warming. Now we're certainly worried by global warming. We found a new, new, new class of refrigerants. Um, okay. So uh, I'm sure you've seen this as part of ASHRAE 34, the, the, the classes of refrigerants, uh, you know, A3, A2, A1. Basically, A3 is highly flammable, uh, and, but not toxic. And and uh, A1 is no toxic, not not toxic, and and uh, and not flammable, right? So if you look at the A's and the B's, and that's generally for those of you who don't do um, industrial processes, mostly we're, we're dealing with the A's. Mostly it's A1. Uh, but you know we've done personally, I've done a lot of projects where we have B refrigerants, and you gotta you gotta pay attention. Um, so essentially, also the other thing to worry about is the concentration limit. And, and the reason I'm talking about this is for, it's coming up later on, obviously, uh, as, as part of the rewording and the rewriting of the, of the code, the 2016 section uh, that's coming up. So if you look at R22, for instance, uh, you know, it's A1, so it's it's non-flammable, not toxic, but it displaces oxygen. And the maximum concentration you could have was 13 pounds per thousand cubic feet in a room. And that's why if you go back to ASHRAE 15, which applies for chiller rooms and things like that, it, it basically is the guideline on how to, how to uh, take care of leaks when they do occur, right? But you can see right away in this table why 410A is a great refrigerant. It's an A1, not toxic, not flammable, and it allows you 26 pounds per thousand cubic feet. So you can essentially, that allows VRFs to be used without much concern. Ammonia, obviously different. That's, that's a B. There are some ammonia plants out there, uh, ice skating rinks, uh, certainly on an industrial level, they use them. It's a B2, right? So you got to be very careful about that very different classification and look at the concentration limits, very, very low, 0.014, right? Now CO2, R744, is an A1, right? Obviously CO2 is not flammable, we know that. It's non-toxic, considered non-toxic, but uh, but the concentration limit is much lower than 410A. It's 3.4 pounds per thousand cubic feet. So that's something to worry about with the introduction of the new uh, the new machines that are running on CO2. So uh, if you want to look at all the refrigerants, if you're curious one day, you know, you're not sleeping or something, uh, they're all listed in ASHRAE 34. Um, obviously, they're different refrigerants with different toxicity, different flammability, flammability levels. So you got to look at that. And then when the actual potential concentration exceeds in a system, exceeds the allowable values, you have to, you have to uh, introduce an engineered automatic uh, makeup system to, to, uh, to take care of that. Right, so that's something you really need to look at. Um, the other parts now talking about systems, uh, you have high probability systems and low probability systems. So what's a high probability system? It's pretty much a, a fan coil unit. You have a coil which uh, has refrigerant in it and air passes through. Uh, you know, if you have a leak, you will have 
uh, refrigerant. If you have a leak in the coil, uh, refrigerant will be in, in the in the air, entrained in the air. So that's a high probability system. You got to worry about an indirect closed loop system. So it's a low probability. Essentially, we're talking about a refrigerant to water or refrigerant to other fluid heat exchanger, where you know the 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 the, the heat exchanger is some somewhere outside of the space that's to be conditioned. And so if there's a leak, you're not going to poison anybody, uh, not likely. So it's a low probability system. And again, as a designer, when you design things, all these things come into play. Um, so what is RCL? Why is it important? Uh, and, and you're going to see it's, it's, it's going to become more and more important as we move forward. So the refrigerant concentration limit right, is the, is the limit that can be in the air and to intend to reduce the risk of acute toxicity, asphyxiation, inflammability hazards in normally occupied enclosed spaces. Very simple formula. It's the total system refrigerant charge over the volume of the smallest enclosed occupied space. Now, for those of you who design VRF systems, why is this important? We put one condenser on the roof, and uh, and 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 uh, with that, we feed maybe I don't know, 15, 20, 30 depending on the system, 16 evaporators, right, uh, or more. So in one room, that's, let's say it's a, it's a small bedroom or something like that, you, you have potentially, uh, you know, the, the charge of an entire system. And it's been a problem into how do we calculate that? Depending on which firm you work at, some of them say, well, a room is a room, you have to assume the room, the door is closed. Others say, well, no, an apartment is a room. And the doors are never closed. Nobody closes their doors. You know, if you have teenage kids, you know, doors are closed. But anyway, uh, so the new version of the code actually takes care of all these things. You know, we no longer have to argue these things. So that's why it's important. Um, so ANSI ASHRAE Standard 34, what does it say? Basically, this is a listing of what it tells you. It's got the OEL, which is the occupation in, uh, occupational safety limit. It's not for uh, occupants, it's for people in, in factories and things like that. Um, the, the, the RCL, which is essentially what we designed for. So 410A, you, it'd be 26. That's the number I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, and it's neither toxic nor, uh, nor flammable, right? Uh, so VRF refrigerant charge concerns. So normal rule of thumb, per, per pound per ton, right, does not apply. If you have a system in a high-rise building with a lot of piping, right, so most of the charge is in the piping. You got to maintain that pressure. So the two to three or four ton, uh, pound per ton really doesn't apply there. You got to get the data from the manufacturer. It's really highly dependent on the length of piping. And it's not uncommon with high-rise buildings to increase that charge two to three times, sometimes more. And our RCL calculations need to take the full system charge into account. You can't really uh, take what's in the piping or take what's in the compressor or whatever. You, you got to take the whole charge. What is likely to be discharged into one space? Um, so calculating RCL, you know, you got to define your smallest occupied space and then uh, what the maximum number is, right? So it's, it's sometimes it's iterative, sometimes it's, uh, it's straightforward, depending on the system and how complicated your system is. You also gotta be careful about means of egress. You know, we'll get to that. Stairs, obviously shafts with opening the living quarters. You know, not, not a good idea to run, <clears throat> uh, you know, refrigerant piping and stairs. Means of egress, you got different, different uh, criteria for doing that. So be careful how you run your piping and how you design. We have a quick question to address, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Ask, is introducing door undercuts, um, can that count as using whole apartment as a room for charge <laughs> safe calculation? All right, so, so I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and we're, we're going to discuss that because that's another thing as to, you know, how and why and you know, is an undercut uh, adequate? Uh, and 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 I'm getting to that. Actually, this this slide that talks about this a little bit. So I'll I'll answer it. You know, I'll answer it in the coming slides. And if it's not answered, let's go back to it in the end. 
Um, so calculating RCL, right? Obviously volume of smallest enclosed space. The space is connected through minimum calculated areas, permanent openings are considered a single space, right? So you need to have a permanent opening. What is a permanent opening? And in the current version of the code, that's a question, right? Uh, is an undercut a permanent opening? Is it adequate? Is it not adequate? I don't know. Nobody knows. It's not an ASHRAE. It's not in the international code. It's nowhere to be to be calculated. So every firm has their own different criteria. Thankfully, we haven't had an accident. Nobody's died, and it's fine so far. Uh, so volume of plenum can be considered if it's part of the return system, right? So so also be careful. How how do you calculate your volume, right? If 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 it's open, it's got a return plenum and it's part of the return, yeah, you can use it. Um, volume of ducts can be included if you're actually blowing, you know, using an air system, right? you could do that. Now, the problem is ASHRAE 15 does not specify size or location of permanent openings. And that, that's been the biggest problem we've had, right? The 2016 New York City code upcoming very soon, it does, right? And this is, this is really what it's about. We, we actually worked very hard on, on finding a, a, a good scientific way of dealing with this. So it takes away all the uncertainty from the designers. So just an undercut, exactly, will no longer be adequate. Why is it not adequate? Because essentially you need an air makeup system. You know, if the refrigerant is to escape, it is heavier than air, right? 410A is heavier than air, right? And CO2 is heavier than that. So if, if it is to escape through the undercut, if there's no makeup, if you don't have an open window, you don't have a high uh, makeup system, uh, it, nothing's happening. So it's not going anywhere. And that's why it's not adequate. So VRFs are not going anywhere. We know that there's local law 97, decarbonization. I think uh, that's the next presentation coming up uh, about, about why VRFs are so good. But I just wanted to give you that one slide that basically gives you the emitted projected emission of CO2 per uh, <clears throat> per system, right? For 2014 building construction code. And if you look at, at what we have here, summer and winter, I mean, obviously the, the, the CO2 emissions that we worry about in New York City is more winter than, than summer. You can see that on the charts. But if you look at a baseboard with a sleeve AC, which is a large, large proportion of the buildings we have, right? It's about 12 pounds of CO2 per square foot for the season, right? For winter, and then, uh, you know, 1.8 for summer. So no big deal, right? So so we all worry about the efficiency of that of that window AC, but really <laughs> it's, the, it's the baseboard with a gas-fired uh, boiler you know, at 85% or 82% efficiency, that's the problem more than the summer. Anyway, uh, PTAC systems, you know, next one, a little better, but not so much, all right? Uh, hybrid heat pump, I guess we call them hybrid heat pumps, but it's really a water-cooled, you know, that, that has two coils. Um, it, again, a little better, but, but, but not so much. Water source heat pump, uh, again, a, another favorite of condominiums. Uh, or, or used to be, I guess it's uh, lesser now, but, but uh, not a good carbon, um, on the carbon emission level, it's not a good system. And you can see a VRF, I mean, it's four, four, four pounds per square feet in the, in, the, uh, in the winter and a little less, maybe one, one, one pound per square foot in the summertime. So that's, this is what's driving essentially, uh, you know, the, the numbers, right? Local on 97, how do we reduce carbon uh, footprint? Here we go. Uh, right now, it's really the VRFs. Um, so let's jump into the 2016 version of the code. I think what everybody's waiting for, you know, what is this new code going to look like? Uh, <clears throat> let's go back to the 14 quickly, just to give you a recap. I, most of you remember uh, the 10 pound uh, rule in the corridors, right? Public corridors, you can't have more than 10 pounds. So what did we do? Oh, well, gee, let's uh, fire rate the ceiling so it's no longer part of the corridor. Um, you know, most of you are probably chuckling about this because we do it and we've done it and, uh, you know, uh, you know, developers are, are saying, well, what's the problem? It's it's not part of the corridor, it's fire rated, architects want it. And you end up putting way more than 10 pounds 
within the corridor, but it's not the corridor, right? What's the problem with that? It, you know, the refrigerant is not flammable. So for you to put, in, put it in a fire rated partition, what have you done? Nothing. Um, and it's not, it's not gas proof. So it's not, right? It's, so if there's a leak, yeah, it's fireproof, but you still have the holes through the, for the lights. You still have cracks. You still have all other things that basically make it fireproof, but not gas proof. So the refrigerant is going to fall down and it's going to fall into the corridor. So we looked at that 10 pound rule and you know, we, 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 we scratched our heads and we had it in the old version and we, we looked at it now and said, look, we, we, we got to find a more scientific way of dealing with this. So that's going away, right? Uh, and it's replaced with something much, much, uh, I, I think it's easier to follow, but you'll find out. Uh, <clears throat> so same thing, we couldn't have more than one system refrigerant piping per tenant, 50% of allowable refrigerant densities, right? Um, and installed with brace joints. That's what we have today. So what we're moving into, right? Very simply, we kept the first sentence, refrigerant piping shall not be installed in public corridors. And of course, you know, codes have to be codes, have to be written in codes. So we can install in public corridors, except, right? So you can install them with brace joints uh, as, as we did before, that, that makes sense. And if you have a discharge of the entire system, as long as you don't exceed 50% of the allowable RCL, right? So for 410A, it's 26. So 26 divided by 2, 13. If your RCL is under 13, you're okay. You can run that refrigerant in the corridor without having to worry about a fire partition or, or or anything like that. Of course, it has to be above the ceiling. It has to be protected, but you can run it, right? Um, and if it has to be a, a one refrigerant, obviously non-flammable, non-toxic, because that's that's a means of egress. I mean, that, the reason we deal with corridors differently, it's an egress, right? Or, so there is an or there. We're giving you an out. If you do exceed 50%, but never above 100%, so you can never be above 100%. I mean, that's 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 the rule, right? It's always got to be in the corridor. It's 26 for, for 10A is going to be the rule. But if you do exceed that 13, right, 50% of the allowable concentration, you need to provide uh, uh, ref, uh, refrigerant alarms, shutoff valves, you know, solenoid shutoff valves, um, and 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 all of that. So so just and make sure that the the actuation time of the and the location of the valves whenever they shut, depending on where the leak is, you never exceed that concentration that is max, right? So that's there's an out there and there's a scientific out and then there's a calculatable out. So you can say, okay, that's that's easy. I can do that. Here's my total system charge. Here's the area of the corridor. Here's how I'm running the piping. Blah blah blah. Here's how it's done. Right, you can you can locate the valves. They have to be accessible, maintainable. Blah blah blah. You got to put the alarms. It's not a, it's not going to the fire department because fire departments don't want to hear about it. It's not flammable. Again, this is just uh, occupant safety, but it's a local alarm, right? Uh, but that's how we do it. Um, so the other way of doing it, if you really don't want to do the valves, which I would actually personally discouraged because it's going to be a uh you know the last session the, the, the comm a commissioning nightmare if you don't want to do the valves you can run the piping in a uh, vapor proof schedule 10 piping minimum schedule 10 piping right and weld it so essentially you're saying okay this is it's vapor proof from end to end and i'm bypassing the corridor so that if there's a leak the refrigerant is going somewhere, but it's not going into the corridor. And wherever it's going, make sure that you're not also not exceeding those those deaths, those uh, RCLs. So I hope so far so good. We're all clear. So beyond that, we're going into occupied spaces, and there's a new appendix in in uh, MC11, which is the refrigeration chapter, right? Occupied spaces. So where the total refrigeration system exceeds RCL, you have two options. You provide dilution transfer openings with rooms to fall within the RCL. So, and that's the undercut uh, portion we're talking about, right? Or provide refrigerant leak detection systems with shutoff valves and alarms. 
So here we're no longer saying 50%. You're saying you can go up to the RCL to 26 in one room. If you exceed that, you got to provide uh, dilution transfer openings. Now, what are dilution transfer openings? Again, we're giving you a formula. This is how you do it. How did we get to this formula? Basically, we we went back. I mean, obviously, International Code doesn't talk about this. ASHRAE doesn't talk about this, only because they haven't caught up with VRF yet. They're still talking, you know, machine rooms, killer rooms, blah, 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 you know, big stuff. Uh, so we went back to the to the Japanese code. We went back to the European code, where VRF has been applied for years, and and you know dug through these uh, much more detailed, much thicker codes than 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 we've ever seen, and uh, basically culled it down to something we can all understand. So if you if you exceed the RCL, your dilution transfer opening in one area. Let's say you have a bedroom, right? You can't just say, look, you know, nobody's going to close the door in that bedroom. So it's an entire, it's an entire apartment. No, you can no longer do that. If you exceed 26 or, or 410A, right? So I'm using that, that number that as 410A, so for now. Here's what the area is, right? Minimum required opening A for, for each high and low levels in square feet, high and low. Uh, why do you need a high and low? Because you need a, you need a transfer of air. Otherwise, you know, the, the, the refrigerant is not going to escape. It's, it's basically, right, if you, have, if you have a tube and you put your finger on top, nothing's coming down. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. You need makeup. Um, and, and buildings are getting tighter and tighter, so we can't say, well, windows are leaky, this, that. I mean, that, all that goes away. Here's your formula. M is the system charge in pounds. V is the room volume in square feet, in cubic feet, apologies. And RCL is the is as listed in, in ASHRAE 34, the refrigerant concentration limits, right? Now, additional rule, the lower edge of the low level opening, right? So you have two openings, one high, one low. The lower edge of the low level, right? So the, the bottom edge of the low level is no higher than six inches above the finished floor. So a door end of cut works, right? The upper edge of the upper opening, right? you don't want to go too high is no lower than the upper edge of the opening of hold on i'm blocking my screen here of the door opening or seven feet above finished floor right so if you do want to have an undercut you need it up up and bottom essentially now this is a nice formula but most of you probably don't have numbers so you don't know what it represents let's let's go to an example so what does that represent? Is it, is it something we can work with? Is it, is it unworkable? Uh, what are we talking about? So let's say we're using 410A and we have a total charge of 100 pounds in a system and you're running through a bedroom that's eight by 10, right? In, in an apartment that's 700 square feet. So we, we took a, you know, a, a, a typical uh, rental building, let's say, in, in Manhattan, whatever it is, right? A one bedroom, 700 square feet. So your ceilings are nine feet uh, above finished floor. So from table 13, uh, 1103 and, and in the code, right? 410A has an RCL of 26. We know that. The bedroom volume, easy to calculate, eight by 10 by nine, 720 cubic feet, right? You go back to that equation. You plug in the numbers and you end up with essentially 0.184 square foot each, high, low. So essentially that equates to 26.5 square inches, right? 26.5 square inches, if you have a door that's 36 inches, is nothing. You can do it. So at a minimum, at a minimum, a low opening of 26.5 square inch and a high opening of 26.5 square inch are required. Right? That's it. I mean, that, that has become now part of the code. You go back to the meeting, developer, architect, whatever it is, say, look, that's, that's the code. There's nothing I can do about it. There's no sense arguing what the undercut has to be. This is the charge. This is what I have to do. So we've taken the pressure off the designers who are basically, we ended up being getting stuck in meetings, arguing how, what an undercut was, and you know they wanted it less, and developers didn't want it, and, and on and on. And then we would argue, they would make us, agree to the fact that 
you know, a room is an apartment, like the, the entire apartment is one space, so it's fine, right? We no longer have to do that. So, I mean, we have to, we have to agree that most of us were put in very difficult situations. And that's what we're trying to do here is trying to quantify it and say, that's it with logic, obviously. So for a 36 inch wide door, it represents a three quarter inch on the cut. Not too bad. There are other ways to do it. You can provide other, other, right? I mean, that will use it. Well, you know, I'm sure we, we can be creative about that if we don't like on the cuts. So next, after that, we have to verify that the total apartment volume is added, right? So, so it's not just for that room. Fine, you provide an undercut because we exceeded the uh, the RCL. But for that, for that, for the apartment, 700 square feet, you know, would that work, right? Apartment volume, 700 times nine. Obviously, you can get uh, very sophisticated. You want to take out some 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 soffits, things like that. I, I you know, we, we didn't do that here. 6,300 uh, cubic feet, uh, so the 6.3 MCF, done, okay? So refrigerant concentration, 100 pounds, divided by 6.3 uh, 6 thousand cubic feet, you end up with 15.87 pounds per thousand cubic feet, which is under the RCL of 26. We're good. So well, I got so, a couple of questions, if you don't mind me interrupting quickly. Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. This is, I mean, this is, this is good, because it's all new territory here. Yes. Yeah. The, the first question is, how does RCL apply to fire egress stairs? Don't run refrigerant in stairs. I mean, we're not supposed to run anything in those stairs, right? Except for the standpipe. Okay, that's an easy one. Okay, next is, if you have a water-cooled condenser in a closet that is non-occupable, occupable, sorry, occupied, would it be classified as a machine room for RCL, or because you have to open the door to service the unit, you can take the entire space as the RCL? Uh, well, I mean, there's no, there's no, it's a closet, right? It's a closet and it's not vapor proof. So if you have a leak in that, in that closet, the, the refrigerant is going to find its way out of the closet somewhere into that room. Or into that that space, right? So again, what we're talking about here is vapor proof, right? So so and nothing is vapor proof unless it's vapor proof. So we're not we're not saying well it's it's a it's a two door it's a two hour fire rated uh, door, right? That that applies for a fire. It doesn't apply for a gas. And that's that's really the distinction we're trying to make here. Right, it's like it, it's it's almost similar to the, the the problem we've had when we were dealing with fire, and then all of a sudden now we have smoke. We have smoke partitions now in the code, right? Not just fire, and just you know, just the two-hour fire rated is no longer just by virtue of it being a two-hour also a smoke partition. Sometimes you just have a smoke partition. But it's the same thing with fire with the, with the, with, the, with with gas, right? So do you have to treat it as such? I mean, there's nobody in that closet, right? Nobody enters that closet. It's just it's just a box, and then you open the door to maintain it. If I understand correctly what you what you're saying, but if you have a leak there, the refrigerant is gonna it's it's gonna find its way through the the crack of the doors or whatever it is into that bedroom or that 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 living space wherever it is. This is where you got to check for the uh, you know if you exceed 26, then you got to do undercuts and things like that. Right. Otherwise, you could provide within that closet a an exhaust system. Okay. So, a couple other questions. Just to clarify, that they were talking about water cooled VRF, but I think that it was covered. Um, sure. And I think they were saying that the closet is not occupiable. I don't think that I was pronouncing it. <laughs> a little dyslexic. So, oh, last oh, question. Yeah. Is, yeah. Um, what if a new apartment has a door with undercut? But the tenant finds it not good acoustical insulation and change to non undercut door after a couple of months. That's not on you. I mean, that, you know, a lot. Look, how many times have you walked into an apartment and the electrical panel is covered by a painting or something, or, or you know, or you go into a, a basement where it says no storage, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the electrical room, right? The switch gear room, and there's, you know, uh, boxes and boxes of toilet paper and, and napkins. Uh, yeah, 
it's not your problem as a designer. I mean, all we're trying to do here is, uh, you know, as a designer, all you, you know, if you, if your design intent is one thing, and then the tenant does something and doesn't file it, it's not your problem. Okay, great. That was the that was all the questions for now. I'll let you keep going. Right. Right. Again, I mean. Uh, uh, you know that that question actually. You know, it, it, we see this a lot, right? Um, you design something one way, and then you go back six or seven months later, and so the tenant or the occupant or whatever changed something, and it's no longer uh, code compliant. Right? If you see it, you got to tell them. If you see it and you don't tell them, there's a problem, uh, right? Because obviously, if something happens, then you know, you saw it and you did nothing about it, it's, right? So you, you have to tell them, but if they don't address it, right? It's not your responsibility to go, you know, write them out. You've told them, you know, you've written, you've written a letter or something, or you told them verbally and there was somebody that was a witness, and something, you're done, right? Your job here is to, is to design properly and to have a, a code compliant design. What happens afterwards, is no longer on you, right? If it's been installed properly, modifications down the line are no, no longer on you. All right, so let's let's go on. <clears throat> so detectors and shutoff valves. What do we do with those? Right. Again, I mean, I, I'm I'm uh, I, I would say to everyone, if we can avoid those, let's let's try to avoid those. Uh, it should not be the go-to, right? Uh, however, sometimes we're gonna need them. Where RCL is above the allowable. Right, uh, so the shutoff valves need to close in the event of a power failure of the system. So that obviously, right, it's a safety. Uh, <clears throat> location of valves shall ensure that 50% RCL is not exceeded in the event of a leak. So let's say uh, you know you, you you have the 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 valve somewhere midway between the condenser and the actual fan coil where you, you're, you're exceeding the RCL, right? If you have a valve, you gotta make sure that when that, that valve shuts, whatever remains downstream of that valve is not exceeding 50% RCL. And so it gets a little tedious, right? you know, you gotta have to actually get like concentrations in the piping, this, that, whatever, right? <clears throat> and then you shall not locate the, uh, the valve in an occupied space, right? And they need to be accessible. So you got to put them somewhere like, you know, in, I don't know, uh, in closets or in, in the trash rooms or whatever, but they need to be accessible. Refrigerant detectors, right? So they're set to trigger alarm and shut off at no more than 25% RCL or 50% OEL, right? Whichever the lowest. So again, uh, OEL is the occupational value, right? The 20, 20 RCL is the refrigerant concentration limit. Detect the failure to activate valve shut off and alarm. So it gets complicated. Think about the commissioning of all of them. And then location to be within normal FCU airflow patterns, right? You can't put the not in a room or corner or closet, right? Again, why did we do this? Because we know the, the, the pressures that we we fall under, right? It's you know, somebody's gonna come back and say, I don't want to see this thing, put it in the closet. No, it's gotta be within the airflow pattern of the room, right? So next to a thermostat, you know, somewhere. Right? It's gotta be in a place that actually senses airflow. Uh, the alarms, right? Local alarms, so it's not going to the fire department. And uh, the power source for the alarm is, has to be independent from the HVAC system served. So not on the same breaker. All right, questions? Do you guys have more questions? I, I don't see anything else in the queue, but let's give people a couple of minutes to ask some. Okay. I think I see someone typing something. Good. Okay, here we go. Can you explain one more time regarding the door undercut slash uppercut solution? Okay. 
Let me head back to uh, that formula. So, all right, so that, that's what we call the dilution transfer openings, right? Um, so essentially, you know, what we've, what we've done in the past, uh, in the absence of any guidance, right? Uh, we either basically claim that a bedroom was not a confined space because, you know, a door doesn't, doesn't represent a, a permanent, right? A permanent obstruction, it's, it's something that could open. So we would calculate essentially the entire apartment and say, well, you know, and then you have undercuts and this and that. So it's reasonable to say the apartment represents one space. Obviously, that doesn't work, right? We, I mean, we've we've poured through the the Japanese code and the European codes and done a lot of research in, into this. Um, and again, you know, that's how we came back. We came up with, with with this formula. So this is a scientific formula. It's not something we just you know pulled out of thin air, right? And 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 how it works if if you just provide an undercut, right? The refrigerant is going to sink. It is heavier than air, so it's going to sink, right? And yeah, some of it is probably gonna gonna escape through the undercut, but unless you have a high opening makeup to allow on you know oxygen or air to 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 come back to to replenish that, you, you're not gonna get right the the the, 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 the refrigerant is just gonna concentrate in that space. And this is why the bottom undercut alone is not acceptable. That you need you need both. You need a makeup. Do they have to be on the same wall? Absolutely not, right? If you have a trickle vent, right? Presuming the trickle vent stays open, uh, right? That's a permanent opening, so you can bring air from outside. Uh, if you have out, if you have outside air, right, coming into the room, and it's a, it's a, it's a you know, let's say it's a passive house, right? Then you have outside air coming into the room at let's say you know 15 cfm or whatever it is. Right, you can calculate that and say, all right, that's that's enough. That's my and and here's the location. It's high, so I provide a low undercut. That's that's appropriate. I can do that, right? So those are those are the ways. You know, you have different different vehicles, but the bottom line is, we didn't want anybody falling into the the the, the loose interpretations that we have with the current version of the code. Right, so we want everybody on the same page. So uh, I don't know if you want me to get through the formula. I guess the formula is pretty self-explanatory. I, I presume you're going to uh, make these slides available? Yes, definitely. And okay. the recording of the presentation. Right. So. OK, great. So a couple more. Um, what is the most potentially new refrigerant after 410A? I, I, I think they mean the most likely potential new refrigerant. Well, I mean. A lot of people are working with the with the blends. The problem with the blends is they're 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 B's, they're not A's. I'm going, I'm scrolling back up to the, you know, um, the problem with these guys is that the 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 the, the, the R one two three four Y F one two three four Z D, you know, those are class B, right? So there's they're there's they're somewhat flammable. There's going to be a problem there, certainly for us, right? In in the in the building industry, 744. I mean, I you know, in the last couple of months, we started specifying a lot of 744 systems uh, for chillers and domestic water heaters. So again, they're outdoors. Only be you know to to to, to bring them indoors with with evaporators. I don't know how that's going to work because because the concentration limit is like three right three pounds per uh, per thousand cubic feet. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, but that's really what we're seeing. Um, and and then you know we'll go from there. If if somebody can come up with a, a, a an A1 refrigerant that's equivalent to 410A that doesn't have a high global warming potential. It'd be wonderful, but you know, so Honeywell, uh, Dupont, you know, uh, the, there's a lot of research being done on on new refrigerants right now. It's really the CO2 systems, and probably we're going to start seeing more of those. 
Okay, great. Next is for piping in public corridors is the only option for an A2L, the vapor proof enclosure. I'm sorry, uh, is the only option? Um, I'm sorry, the question just went away. Uh, an A2L enclosure, I think they're talking about when they're piping in corridors, what type of fire rated enclosure you need around them. It's not a fire rate. I mean, uh, if you have a B, uh, right, if you have a B, obviously it has to be fire rated, right? But what we're talking about here is, and, and the code specifically says, you know, no, only only A1 in corridors, right? If you have a B, it has to be outside the corridor. So if it's outside the corridor, it has to be in in a, uh, you know, in a fire rated, right? Double ceiling, whatever it is. Plus it has to be gas proof. So you, you're gonna need both the fire rating and the uh the 10 gauge uh you know welded pipe to contain that right so again you know be mindful of of you know don't don't look at it blindly here and there's like well the code doesn't specifically say this look at it in a broad term like as a designer what would you do if it's you know if you're trying to prevent gas from penetrating into a corridor just having a, 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 a pure two layers of sheetrock fire enclosure is not doing it. You know it's not doing it. You know, so the you know, follow the intent. What is the intent? The intent is to prevent the gas from actually dropping down onto, you know, and, and causing hazardous conditions. So you know, just anyway, to clarify, but, the person who asked the question just clarified and said, I was asking the question for an A2L refrigerant, not a B. There was a portion on the slide that mentioned a vapor proof or 18 gauge enclosure for an A1 refrigerant. Right. So so the code specifically says in, in, in corridors, you can only do A1. Right. Uh, if, if it's A2, you, you can't run A2. Uh, you have to, ha it has to be outside the corridor. So, you know, you can, you can have it within the corridor, but outside the corridor in a, in a gas proof slash fireproof enclosure, right? That becomes outside the corridor. It's like the, it's like gas, right? Okay. Next is, um, the, um, I'm sorry. Some of the questions are a little segmented. Um, do you include compliance calcs on dry, drawings filed with the DOD? Uh, yes. Okay, that was a quick one. Does the code deal with flammability in the fire department? And um, follow-ups that does, um, I, I think they're talking about the new code. Well, the new code really, the, the, the if you take the old the old code uh, and the new and the new code only really uh, added you know the flammability and all that really nothing changed there right it's just how do we address vrf we wanted to incorporate the vrf technology into chapter 11 which which wasn't talked about at all right so we recognized that look this this this, this whole section of the code basically incorporated the arbitrary 10 pound rule in 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 in, in, cor in public corridors but didn't talk about occupied spaces and all that. So this this is really those 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 two sections. This is how it, it deals with it. The rest, everything else, the B1, B2, all of that, nothing nothing else changed, right? We're still following the international code and ASHRAE with that. Next question is, um, and I don't think based on what you just said, it sounds like it's a no. Is there any change with relief to the 15 horsepower compressor rule? Not yet. Not yet. I mean, I'm. Uh, we're working hard on the, you know, it, it, when we have something like CO2 and all that. Again, but uh, that that's that's a fire department issue. <laughs> well, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't been able to climb that that one yet. Okay. Then next is um, how many CFM outside air in a passive house? Eight by ten bedroom is required in lieu of high low vents the specific well, you're gonna need right you're gonna need a low vent right you're gonna need you gotta need a dilution or you're gonna need an exhaust right so you can do the calculation based on that yeah we'll make the slides available so you can see all the calculations okay and then um 
question in corridors joints must be brazed not press fitted correct Correct. and follow-up is where could press fittings be used for joints could they be used in occupied spaces that can you that can be used in occupied space yeah press fitting i mean it's actually allowed in in you know within ashway within the code as well but not right in corridors you got to brace got Still, it right um okay and I think that, um, hold on one more. I think a follow up with passive house, no low vent, but ducted outside air supply and return. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure how that, where that question comes from. Uh, I'll, I'll put you guys together offline. There's a couple questions I think need follow up. Okay. Okay. Well, those are all the questions I have. Thank you so much for. Your time, this was really good and great questions, everyone. So, thank you. All right. You. Oh, you know what? I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, when does the new code take effect? Ah, I, I don't know. It's in the final stages. Uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, that's, that's above my level. Uh, I, I think very soon. I don't have an exact date, but I know it's been, it's been blessed at all levels. So, it should be a few months. Great. Right. Uh, probably, I mean, I, I, I would, I would, you know, guess if, if anything, probably, you know, beginning of September or, uh, or the new year or something. That's going to be a, a, a milestone. Uh, but probably very soon. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank great. you so much. I'm going to switch it over to Lois, and we're going to jump into the next presentation. Sounds good. All right. Are you there, Lois? Can we hear I'm you? Here. Can you hear me? Yes, we see your email. Um. See my email. Okay. How do I, where am I going to change my screen? <laughs> um, if you go to the show in the drop down menu um, on the panel, the control panel for GoToWebinar, it should allow you to switch to PowerPoint. The GoToWebinar? Yeah, the go to webinar panel on the right side. Preferences? No, webcam. Nope. All right, hold on. Let me uh, escape. <coughs> I just want to change where which one's showing my screen. And I'm not no, seeing it. But it's very small. <laughs> yeah, but it can't be on that screen. It needs to be on this one because this is where my camera is. <laughs> okay. Um, and I just don't see where it says change your screen. If you go in the control panel under where it says the button that says show, and there's a little drop down menu that says main screen, it should allow you to choose the PowerPoint window and it should automatically put it on the other display. Okay, okay. show screen. There we go. Okay. PowerPoint there. now? Yeah. Okay. Now we're good. Just put it in presentation mode. And... Just one second. I just have to change the setting. Okay. 